This is from uh, Rick Renner, Sparkling Gems. I would encourage all of you to get this. You know, from time to time, you pull it out. But anyway, um, Jude uh, 123 tells you, um, it says, uh, pulling others, uh, save others with fear, snatching them out of the fire, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So what he says here, he says, the word fear, now this is not the fear I'm going to talk about, but the word fear is the word phobos. In this particular case, it invokes a fear or a strong dose of respect for something that is life-threatening, dangerous, and alarming. Jude uses this word fear to let, let us know that believers who continue in sin place themselves in a very precarious, dangerous, and alarming situation. This is no game. Sin in the life of a believer is extremely serious. Therefore, Jude commands us to act intimately, immediately, excuse me, when we see a fellow brother or sister compromising. Now, we're going to share something along this real quick. It's only like another paragraph. When you see a brother or sister compromise, right, if you don't have a relationship with them, if God doesn't lead you, then you got no business going over to that person and trying to, you know, be the Holy, Bo Holy Spirit corrector. Amen. You need to be, that's what the Lord said. Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, right? And so, and do you know that many times Jesus never went and corrected the Pharisees? Amen. Are you here this morning? Come on, help me out. Jesus didn't walk around just correcting people. When they addressed him and engaged him, then he corrected them. But his mission was not to go out and find Pharisees and to correct them. No, read the Bible. Amen. Help me out this morning. He did not go, hey, today, fellas, we're going out, 12 apostles. We're going to find all the Pharisees and correct their doctrine. Okay? Waste of time. When they approach or came in contact and then they tried to bring scripture which they had distorted traditions of men, he corrected them. Amen. This is good Bible teaching here. Okay. So point for you and I to be taken. Okay. And then worldly people, he never corrected. Why? Why don't you correct worldly people? I mean, it's real simple. I don't want to get in this mode. Lord, help me, Jesus. This is for Tuesday. Well, they're, they're not open to hearing, but they don't read the word anyway. So what would you be correcting? <laughs> what would you be correcting, actually? They don't No, talking about unbelievers, unbelievers, worldly people, unbelievers, non-Christians or non-Jews. But you don't go around correcting non-Jews and unbelievers. If you read the Bible, it even tells you, so don't waste your time judging them. It's a waste. That's why I don't judge worldly people. It's not my place. They're already in the, in, you know, they're, but the, so the, re, the point I said, I don't want to waste my, my message. This is Tuesday for all. So the reality is, is you don't waste your time. Paul never went out, chased people. What you and I do in Jesus, when they approach you and they try to bring distortion or air or traditions of men, then you, because they've yielded and open themselves up for correction now, right? But correction from the word. Because your desire is to speak the truth in love. If your desire is to win the argument, if your desire is to win the argument or your desire is to show them, then you miss the boat, right? Okay, so let's move on. So what he says here, this meaning could be translated. Because of the alarming, dangerous state that some believers are in, I urge you to take immediate and fast-acting measures to see them delivered and rescued. And if they don't quickly respond, don't stop. You need to keep up your sense of urgency until you are convinced that they are rescued. Now, that happens in many things, in prayer and different things. This, there, there, there is no doubt about it. This verse places a heavy responsibility. Now, you can see right here all these secret, sensitive, sensual churches and people that are disengaged from addressing issues in Christianity people that name the name of Christianity and kind of say they're, you know, praying and all this, that you and I must address the issues. And I'm not talking about the weakest issues are drinking, smoking, 
and perversity. What is the greatest issue you should address in a person's life? The first, a Christian, I'm saying, someone that names the name of the Lord. The first issue you should address in them. Their first issue. No, it's not get right. What church do you go to? What church do you go to? Because you already know they're not right. So you already know they're, they're if, if a person says they're a Christian, they don't go to church, you already know they're not living for God. So you don't need to get them right. You need to get them in church. Once they get in church, the atmosphere in the body of Christ and the anointing that's on the body convicts them of their lifestyle. The first thing is, what church do you go to? And then when they say they don't go to church, then you say, well, you said you follow Jesus, though. Because the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling yourself, such as the bad manner of some. They have bad manners, right? Bad manners, right? So the reality is, is when they're connected with the body, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words, abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it shall be done for you. So if you don't abide in his word and in him, you're cast forth as a branch that's withered. So lots of people say they're Christian, but they're withered. And what that means is they're unfruitful. They're not bearing fruit, right? And what are the fruits? Love, joy, peace, goodness, generous, meekness, faithfulness, the fruits of righteousness, all these fruits, right? Fruits of the spirit. Fruits of serving in the kingdom, fruits of being a part of. We should all be in a fruit production, but if you're a withered branch, you're not in production anymore. No matter how much you tell people you pray. Because a lot of people are praying out of their own mind, like the Jews. They they pray vainly, Jesus said. They think for their much speaking, they'll be heard. Isn't that what Jesus said? But they're not going to be heard. So let's move away from that so we don't waste all our time talking about that. So it's our job. To snatch them. Jesus speaks in a commanding tone of voice to let us know that we don't have a choice in this matter. We must act deliberately and be continuous and unending in our efforts. So if you know a friend or a loved one who's allowing serious sin to continue in their life, pray for him. Then go to him and express your concerns of love. Love that person enough to speak the truth to them. Act fast on this behalf. And do what you can to save them. Otherwise, he may eventually make mistakes that bring disaster and destruction upon their life. That's why Jude says the possible consequences are very ser too serious to ignore. What? We must do everything within our power to help believers so that they're uh, whatever established or whatever. I forget. I didn't read the part. But this, is a, this was a good little nugget, right? That you and I should do our part. We're in an hour now um, where we should not be, you know, neglecting or disengaged. Amen. You and I should be in a place of calling people to. And that way, what that does, it gives them something just like that brother I told you or other people. If you're not, you know, there was a guy I saw the other day. I was talking to him and he was, you know, he he posts a lot of stuff about. Uh, and, and he's a Catholic guy. And then I said, you know, the problem is, is a lot of people that say they're Christians don't go to church. And I could just see all his confidence and everything went. Just by saying that, it shut him down because he says he's a believer. But he don't go to church. So it just squelched him right there. And he's a good dude. He, I mean, I like the guy. He, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he's a guy from my neighborhood. Rita would know him. But as soon as I say, you know, the problem is a lot of people say to Christians, don't go to church. And now it just came out of my spirit. It wasn't something I thought about. I wasn't trying to say, but, but I thought about it after I could see his countenance go, why? Because he believes he's a believer, but he ain't really obeying. And when you're not obeying, there's a glitch in your communion with God. When you come in contact with somebody who is a believer, what happens is the light in them exposes the darkness right? The light. You don't even have to tell him. I don't know, you know, if that guy's what he's doing, but I can tell you this. If you say you name the name of the Lord, but you're not fellowshipping with a local body, you're not under a pastor too, right? Sheep have a shepherd. It's real simple, right? Without a pastor, you're a big disaster. It's that simple. Amen. That's what my friend said. Little Glenn, who's from the hippie movement. No pastor, big disaster. Sheep have a shepherd. It's that simple. 
and everybody's a sheep in some capacity. Amen. So praise the Lord. But our part is to, what's wrong with that thing right there? Our part is to reach out to people, believers and unbelievers alike. And in this time we're living in, because what a greater time for you to extend the love of God. And especially with the COVID issue, you can just utilize that to your benefit, to the kingdom's benefit so much. Because there's so many opinions and so many views and so many ideas. It's, and, and there's no security. People feel vulnerable with all the stuff going on in the world. And good. Because don't think that the Lord ain't behind it. Right? The Lord takes, that uses the things that are in the earth to strategize, to usher in people. How many of you understand that? The, the, the trials, the, tr the turbulence, the adversity, uh, you know, the tribulation, uh, you know, is just a platform for the Lord to rescue people, right? Because usually it's only when people feel um, uh, out of control, they in danger, uh, without a sense of assuredness, you know. In these uncertain times, people always say, I heard one guy say, it's not uncertain. It's not uncertain for you and me. It is uncertain uh, to be truthful, and, and it shouldn't be for some Christians, though. Because they're not in the word. They're not in fellowship. You understand that? It's very important. They're not established. And so what happens, their mind is filled with all the uncertainties of the stock market, uh, the, you know, the southern border, uh, you know, the northern border, you know, the COVID this, the Fauci that, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, all the stuff going on, the race this, the race that, the Biden this, the Trump that, the CNN this, the Fox that. <laughs> but here's what I want to tell you. Observe everything, but only eat right here. Because you better have some facts when you're talking to the secular realm. You need facts for them, not for you. You're already convinced, aren't you? You're already persuaded, glory to God. You know, fully persuaded, right? And that's all we're doing is we're just inundating ourselves more and more. And like I said, you know, and of course the devil always shows up once in a while and goes, he always tries to tell you, as soon as you make a bold statement, like I'm COVID free and don't plan on getting COVID, the devil, he'll always try to broadcast the opposite of your bold confession. So if you say I'm COVID free, now, now here's the thing, like I told somebody before, you can't run around and say I'm COVID free, but you don't read healing scriptures. I tell, matter of fact, I've told Rich, I tell Eric all the time, but pe people run around and go, God takes care of me. Look, man. If you do not feed on healing verses on a frequent, consistent basis, then you have no base foundation to say you're going to live COVID free because you don't understand. You're just kind of generalizing. How many understand? Even these city workers that came in, I told them. And I told them, and the guy that was sitting here said, we better familiarize ourselves with these verses. And I said, yeah, you better. Because if you think you're just going to get a free pass because of a letter, look, man, they're going to bring you under scrutiny. And a lot of people try to bring letters and they've already been rejected. You know? So you, you have to be like a lawyer. How many of you understand what I'm saying? And if you don't know the word, you won't be a lawyer. You won't. You won't be a lawyer. Like you can try to come at me with anything, but number one, I have the counsel inside. So like I looked at the questions, I have them right here, pretty heavy. And actually a friend came back and he said, yeah, they sent a letter back then and said, well, did you take this, 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 this? And if you took those, why wouldn't you take this? Because they come from the same process and the same lab and the same this and the same. So what are you going to say now? Oh, I did take those. But, you know, here, here's the thing. That's what it said. But, you know, actually the Lord, and then we'll get to the, the sermons. I'm just trying to tell you. In this hour, it's not time to play games. 
And you need to know, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Amen. And so uh, that's what's important for people to be here on Tuesday for healing. And then we're going to be starting a healing school. And so watch how many people flock, not just the COVID, but all the things going on with people. Oh, just like that brother, I, uh, I told you had the brain thing, brother chemo. I prayed for him over the phone. And actually this lady who works at Stanford, who was at the football game on Friday night, uh, Laven, who her son was on the football team. She was one of the moms for the, uh, you know, when you coach Pop Warner, you always have moms doing like she collect, she, process to coach in pop warner you guys don't realize you have to show up with a booklet with a picture with grades they have to weigh in every week they i mean it's a whole tedious process so anyway she works at stanford and she's like you talk to him i was like yeah she's like oh wow she's like he'll never be the same see from and she's she's a christian she wasn't but years ago i spoke to her and prayed for her and, and then eventually chemo, I think, brought her to some church. But my point is this. She works at Stanford. She's knowledge. She's a nurse. She's a whatever. I don't know. Whatever she does. But my point is in her natural reasoning, which is true, a person that goes through trauma in their brain like that probably is not going to be the same as they were pre the problem. Don't you agree? I mean, just naturally. But I said to her, I said, yeah, but God can quicken that thing. See, for the natural person, they just buy right in. The doctor says, you know, thank God he's alive, but don't expect too much. <laughs> just like they told Brother Hagen when that pastor came and tapped him as he's lying on his bedside and said, that's all right. It'll all be over soon. And the Lord spoke to Brother Hagen and, and, and he said, faith ain't done away with. Because they all said, well, you know, the apostles and miracles have done away with and the Lord said to Brother Hagin, the Lord said, amen, faith ain't done away with. And then the Lord said to Brother Hagin, if her faith made her whole, your faith can make you whole. Come on now. So you can say, well, you know, the healing went out with the apostles and speaking tongues went out. and nah, 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 nah. But the Lord said, faith ain't done away with glory that means there ain't no limitations in your life whatever's written in the scriptures are yes and amen but your faith has to be able to lay hold on it like the woman with the issue of blood so the dependency ain't on nobody else but you glory to god and whether you know chemo can rise up and be the person that god wants him to be still will be dependent upon his faith nobody else i mean prayer helps amen Prayer helps. And this other pastor that comes behind us, I text his wife in it and she said he's in the ICU and da 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 da. And, you know, and it, I'll tell you, it brings tears to my heart and it frustrates me. I'm just being honest because I know this so many Christians, they really don't do what they're supposed to. Do you know that? They don't. The Bible tells you to study to show yourself, attend. And I have to tell myself the same thing. Because it's not a game. Just like he said. You need It's not a game what we're in. In this world. You know. And you look at all the people that. Are supposed to be coming to our church. And even getting to church is a difficulty for them. But making a dollar ain't. God will tell you everything about. It, everything you need to know. Everything. If you listen. But if you're not a listener, you're cutting yourself off. So, series biz. I would tell you, just like I take vitamin C pretty much on a daily basis for 29 years. And I may miss a day or two, but, you know, I'm pretty steady on it. I would suggest you feed on the word of healing on a regular basis. And actually, that's what Brother Hagin told a lot of people. Feed on healing, feed on finances, feed on faith. Because the devil will fight you in those areas more than anything else. Those are the areas that you'll get fought. And even people that would say, you know, well, I got COVID already and my immune system's strong enough. Man, don't put all your faith in that. Put your faith in the Lord, man. How many of you understand? I don't put my faith in my past experiences. Put your faith in his mercies anew every morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's take a look at this morning.
Second Timothy. Glory to God. You ready to get into the word? You're hungry. Stand up real quick. Stand up real quick. Stand up real quick. Come on, Rich. Participate, my friend. Come on. I'm going to start helping you guys more. I've been, I'm always very loving and gracious, but man, I'm here to help you. Look, you ain't giving me nothing, not to be mean. I'm <laughs> just telling you. Okay. I'm here to help you. We help one another, but the reality is, is let's work together. Okay. So uh, what's that? Help, help me to help you. Yeah. That was a good movie, wasn't it? Help me to, you guys remember that? You guys don't even remember that movie? Huh? Yeah, but what's the name of the movie? I brought a tear to my eye. Jerry Maguire. You guys never saw that movie? Uh, it's Tom Cruise. He was a sports, um, you know, agent, and he lost his job. And then he put all his, he placed all his eggs in one basket with this one, one guy, uh, and he finally made it. And he was going to get a big contract, and he wanted more then because you know. And so he was getting an attitude and he told him, Jerry, I need this money. And Jerry's like, man, bro, you're just worth this. And he goes, no, 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 no. You ain't telling me that. You need to. And then Jerry was getting all this. He was like, help me to help you. <laughs> you know, because people are bullheaded. I think I'm going to start using that. I use it on Rich. <laughs> all the guys. Help me to help you. Like You feel like that. Like, what is it? Of, not, I'm not talking about Rich or any of you, but what is it about people? They just, they won't listen. You try to help them. They think they know more than you or they have more experience. It's like, if I go, it, it's like, look, I'll even say this. It's like, I do my footwork. Like if some symptom in my body, I go, Google. And then I try to find somebody in our church to call. Isn't it true? And I go, hey, what do you think about this? And it's always behind the doctor. Usually it's best to go that way. And of course, it all, but you go through a series of processes, don't you? Right? Isn't that wisdom? I don't try to like tell myself I'm a doctor. And then, you know, when the doctor's speaking to me and the doctor says, look, man, you uh, need a root canal. And of course, the whole time you're hoping I don't want a root canal because I know the price of a root canal. Like this tooth I just got, it cost like total, it was like a total of 3,500. And my insurance didn't cover a lot. I'm just telling you, man. So, you know, it, it warned you, get the flossing better. <laughs> you know, no, but it was just, it was just corrupt anyway. But my point is, is because a root canal entails time, it entails shots. Who likes those shots that they stick up there? Oh, no one likes that. It is a whole, man, it's just disappointing and discouraging. But the reality is it's there. And I could tell myself all uh, uh, the option, just get it pulled. Get it pulled, man, for 300 bucks, 400 bucks. But the reality is, is I can't self-diagnose. I have to go to the dentist. And then I had to go further, you know, and you got to, you get my point? So it is getting people to work with you, or we call it cooperation. Amen? Cooperation. Praise the Lord. Well, all right, just hold your hands up, Father. Say, thank you. I'm going to receive the indestructible, incorruptible, ever living word of God right now. Thank you for ears to hear, eyes that see, and a heart that's receptive and understanding, Lord, as I yield to you. I thank you, Lord. The word will dwell richly on the inside and, and it will come forth and bring forth fruit, fruit that's pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. This morning, I'm just going to talk about fear. There's so many different things. Second Timothy 1 in verse 7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. Through the new birth, God gave you a spirit of faith. Corinthians tells us we have that same spirit of faith. Say, I got that same spirit of faith. Now, many times people go, I hear people all the time go, I ain't got no fears. And I look and I go, 
that has to do with lots of people don't believe they have any fears. They don't. But as soon as the turbulence, the challenge, the adversity, the trials come, then you begin to see that they, they're still not even in touch with it. Every person that ever walked this planet has dealt with a force called fear. Amen. And the reality is, as soon as Adam sinned, that uh, force of fear entered into humanity. It entered in and began to control and influence man. It was a byproduct in the overflow of the nature of sin and death. Amen. And so anytime things go on, uh, it, it's a byproduct of people operate. There's only two forces to operate in today. It's either faith or fear. You understand? And so you and I have to be taught faith. Amen. You don't, even though when you're born again, uh, you receive the same spirit of faith, but you have to be taught what faith is, how faith works, how do you receive faith, and then how to operate in faith. It's not just, you know, I used to think, and I can say, when I first was saved and I went to even Bible, Bible college, I was sitting there and they were teaching on faith. And I was like, I got faith. Dull and ignorant. I just thought I got faith. I did. I had raw faith. I had, a, I had a diamond in the rough. You understand that? But I did not understand the laws of faith. I didn't. I just I knew I had faith. You know what I mean? Because I was committed to the Lord. I would do anything for the Lord. I prayed all the time. I read the word. But my eyes weren't open to understand the principles that govern the realm of the spirit. And so then I heard, Brother Hagin, never forgot it, ABCs of faith. And I, I finally humbled myself and started listening. This is at Bible school now, you know, because I when you have something that's raw with horsepower, how many understand? You can have raw horsepower. I can put a I can put a jet engine in my truck, so to speak, you know, a small jet engine, a turbine. And that thing can go really fast. But what's gonna happen? Common sense. The what? Wheels will come off. What else is going to happen? Huh? Other parts, the transmission. It's not built for that raw horsepower. Don't you understand that? It, it hasn't been fabricated. Listen very closely. Each part of that truck is only built for the horsepower of that engine. So I had raw horsepower, but I didn't understand how to operate with that horsepower. I had raw faith. But then I had to learn the principles of faith, right? Which is called the ABCs. A, what is faith? B, how does faith come? And C, how do you exercise or release your faith? Those three principles will never leave your life. Amen? Those three principles will never leave your life. So let's look at real quickly uh, um, Hebrews. Go to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews 2. Okay, Hebrews chapter 2. So when Adam sinned, the law of sin and death came in, didn't it? And it created a force called fear. And that fear began to operate right away. It first manifest between God and man, didn't it? How many remember when God walked in the cool of the day and he said, where art thou, Adam? Where was Adam? Hiding. So that, you know, that fear, instead of having faith, which is being fully persuaded, having that spiritual constitution and conviction that God's faithful, he's a rewarder, he's, he loves you with an everlasting love, he's for you, who can be against you, the Lord, your helper. Instead of having that condition operating in him, there he was hiding behind a tree expecting to be judged wasn't he in fear and that fear in him manifest in other ways didn't it how did that fear in him manifest behind the bush the first the first way it manifest was he's hiding this what but what's that's just him but how did it manifest in the earth in relation towards other human beings no no the first way the huh 
Okay, that the shame and guilt. So those are all spiritual things, and and they happen. But what in terms of human relationships? Thank you. He blamed. He blamed. The first way that that fear began to manifest towards another human being was to begin to blame, begin to attack, to begin to accuse. You see that? So that fear begins to do all that kind of stuff. Lots of people don't even see that in themselves. When you're operating in faith and you're operating in love, you're not blaming the devil even. You assess and know who your adversary is, right? You know where the trouble and, and the trials and the uh, afflictions coming from. But the reality is you can't even blame God or the devil because you know your authority and you know you have dominion and a right of rule over these things. Amen? So Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 in verse, let's see, we're going to start uh, in verse 14. I'm going to read the Amplified. Since therefore these his children share in flesh and blood in the physical nature of human beings, he himself in a similar manner uh, partook of the same nature. That by going through death, he might bring to nothing, or not is the word, and make of no effect him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And also that he might deliver and completely set free all those who through the what? Fear of death, or, or Amplified says, haunting fear of death. The haunting fear of death. Fear, right, that is derived from the law of sin and death. And so that fear is constantly bringing haunting and tormenting thoughts to people's lives. Amen. Haunting, tormenting thoughts, right? Afflicting, persecuting thoughts of lack of uh, dying, of inefficiency, inequality. That's what racism is all about too, right? Racism, because no one's stopping you. Look, if you got the law of the spirit of life and you got the Holy Ghost in you and you're armed with the word, nobody can stop you. Nobody can stop. All things are possible to him that is black. All things are possible to him that's white. All things are possible to him that's Asian. All things are possible to him that's Russian. All things that are possible to him that's Filipino. All things are possible to him that's Persian. All things are possible to him that's Samoan. All things are possible to him that's Fijian. All things are possible to him that's Palestinian. God never said all things are possible just to the white guy. That's stupid. Now, I'm not saying that because, you know, I mean, I'm Italian and whatever, but I guess you'd be European. Who really cares? I'm out of the body anyway. <laughs> Amen. I don't live according to Barbithian, Scythian bond. Christ is in me. Amen. I don't live according to my outward man. Glory to God. That's what Paul said. We don't know no man after the flesh no more. So all these people are Christians and then they're by, supposing say with their lip service, they're Christians and they buy into all this race stuff going on and races. They're not a believer. Because you saw, or if they are, they're carnal. Because the reality is, is you don't know any man after the flesh. You're not supposed to know who you, I don't, do you think I really care about Italy? My parent, my dad came over, was born on a boat. Great. I live in America, friend. That's it. I live in America. I'm not concerned about Italy. I mean, I hope bad things don't happen to it, but. You know, the, re the reality is where I came from, my origin. I mean, heritage is great and that's fine and keep your traditions. But if I'm a Christian and I know that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, then that's where my that's where my um, my loyalty is to my loyalty is to the kingdom. Actually, the Bible tells you you're a, in Colossians, a citizen of heaven. So your passports in Christ. So, you know, you, it don't matter what other passport you got in this world. And I mean, the reality is, is you got to start seeing people like that in these times. 
and be careful. You need to start looking for other nations even. Let the Holy Ghost like, like Iran and, and, and other places. You got to start thinking to carry Jesus. Amen? Carry the power of God because if anybody else is any under religion, they're not see They don't have a mangrobo. They don't have the Holy Ghost. They can't pray in the spirit. They can't be liberated on demand. Amen. You and I, all you got, you can be very heavy and weighty and then just slip over near a little prayer corner and start mombraka shataka. Oh, rabaka. I take authority over this heaviness, this sulky frame of mind. I take dominion over this haunting, tormentous fear right now. I command it to be decimated and dismantled right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, rabaka. You begin to take authority and rise up and all of a sudden that sucker lifts. That devil goes, that freedom, that peace, that joy and liberty comes in Jesus' name. Amen. They don't have that. No, no, the Muslim doesn't have that. The Buddhists don't have that. Mm -mm, they don't have that freedom. Mm -mm. And the more you practice that, the more freer you are. Because the reality is we have a, a, a complete redemption. Hebrews 9 says, an everlasting release. It don't run down. It's better than the Energizer battery. Come on now. Do, 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 do. Or, or it's like Timex takes a, takes a, uh, takes a, what does it say? Yeah, it takes a hit and keeps on ticking. You know? Takes a licking and keeps on ticking. God's life does never wane off. It never wanes off. You wane off. Make no mistake about it. And I want to point to you, not because I'm blaming you. I'm saying you and me, you ain't off. Don't you ever think, because there's a lot of, and it bothers me, weak, yielded Christians who start bl uh, blaming. No, you waned off. You gave place. You yielded to the flesh. You're not renewing your mind. You're not diligent to church. You're not a faithful, committed believer. You're not praising and raising and magnifying. So don't you say God withheld from you, friend. Make no error about it. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot, nor does he tempt any man with evil. But every man is tempted and yields and gives when he is enticed by his own baited fostered heirs and lusts of his own body and his own natural outward uh, shell, his own clay shell. You let that thing govern you and you didn't keep that body under, you didn't keep that mind under and your little stinky attitude came out. The little woe is me, the murmuring, griping, complaining. Come on. And your spirit man didn't rise up. You didn't slay that Goliath. Amen. You got to slay your Goliath. Come on. You can't call Uncle Tommy. God didn't call Uncle Tommy to do your prayer for you. You do it. That's why Jesus even said to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you. I pray that your faith fail not. So I'm going to say this in this whole church. I could say, Rita, Sinet, Rosemary, Kim, all of you. Satan has desired to sift you. Seth, I'm going to give you my paraphrase. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it besides just rise up? Okay, great. That's fine, too. But what are you going to do about it lifestyle? That, that's good, too. But what are you going to do about it lifestyle? What are you going to do about it? Feed your faith and make sure you practice it. Make sure you, how do you practice your faith? Read the word on a daily basis. Pray on a daily basis. Worship on a daily basis. Pray in tongues. Get yourself to church every time the door opens. Amen. That's how you live the faithful life. Don't let the book of the law depart out of your mouth, but meditate on it there and day and night. Not when your husband's around or your wife. Who cares if they're around or not? The word in your relationship with Jesus is something you should be enthusiastic with, whether your partner's on board or not. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of marriages. People get left behind. And they go, that person didn't do for me. That's your problem. You didn't walk with God. Prioritize. You didn't set your mind on things above. You kept your mind on the earth. I check Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus never, Jesus never, uh, uh, what's the word? I'm looking for, Lord, help me. Um, 
Um, Jesus never uh, when, when he said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and they went, no, that's hard. He never, he bye. Jesus never said, hold on, let me step it down just so it'll fit what you want. Thank you, compromise. You can't compromise the word. And I'll tell you, that's why the scripture says that Jesus said, I'll come and set a man against his own family or a woman or, or how many of you know that it's in the word. In the Gospels, isn't that what Jesus said? And then when they went, Mama's outside, he went, Who's my mother and my brother? Imagine Jesus coming out and saying that. Yet he honored Mary more than any other man ever honored a woman. But yet when they came saying, You know, your mom's outside trying to work him over, he went, Who's my mother and who's my brother? But they that do the will of God. And even though Jesus honored his mom, I believe this I believe Jesus' mom understood that. I believe Mary understood that though I gave birth to him, that I was used of God Almighty, that is my son in the flesh, but that is my Lord and Savior, as she said. And that although I'm his mother, thank God for the humility in Mary. That's why God chose her, because he, she could have been like, I'm your mother. You better. She recognized, man, that's, that's God's son. He has a calling and a will and a purpose. He's not here to serve me. He's here to do the will of God. And I need to be like everybody else and yield to the will of God and follow him. Amen. I'm telling you, that's not easy. Especially when you held that. But, but she had revelation that put her in a position to walk, walk in faith. Amen. So he says that would destroy and deliver them through the haunting fear of death, who were held in bondage their whole course of lives. Now notice, he delivered us, but you have to operate in that. You got to operate in that. The love of God shed abroad in your heart, Romans 5. Let's take a peek at Romans 5. Then we're going to cruise on out to a couple places. Romans 5. Romans 5.5 5 tells us hope, such hope never disappoints because the love of God's poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given unto us. Go to Titus now. Let's look at Titus. So everybody say the love of God. Say God's agape is shed abroad in my heart. I like the living translation it says one of my favorite verses. Now I'm able to hold my head up high and I know all is well because the brimming river of God's love has been poured out into my heart by the Holy Spirit who's been given to me. The brimming river, the brimming river. The brimming river of God's love is poured out in my heart. And first John tells us there's no fear in that love. So if I'm understanding what's in there, then I should stay conscious of that reality that there's no fear, right? There's no fear in my relationship. Although fear and adversity and challenges may try to come externally, I don't have to receive them and allow them to have influence in my life. I don't have to allow them to dominate me and, and cause me to act, speak, or carry on in ways, right? Like people who are governed and controlled by fear, the fear of death, right? That's what creates a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of selfishness in this life, isn't it? Because the want-tos aren't getting met. So the first thing that happens when, when people's supposed need isn't being met the fear kicks in and says, you're not getting what you want. I'm not getting what I want from God, from another person, from the government, right? I'm not getting what I want. And it creates an anger and it creates a, a hostility in people. When the reality is you're supposed to be getting from God. You're never supposed to be looking to somebody else, a government, a person, a situation to draw your 
satisfaction or appeasement from. And you can see, matter of fact, I'm just thinking of this situation right here. You, you stay right there in Titus. Just stay right there in Titus. I'm thinking of this situation that went on. I'm just going to read it to you. Stay there in Titus. And it happened in Acts 6. The Holy Ghost was moving in, in Acts 6. It said in those days when there was a number of disciples, it was multiplied. There arose a murmuring. Notice how it arises of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Ministration. They were felt neglected. There arose. There arose. So they started grumbling. The talk started going through the camp. The little fleshy creatures that wanted more or, or they felt they were being neglected. We don't really know. It doesn't say what they were receiving. But they felt that. Right? And there were some probably. Usually, how many you know where there's smoke, there's fire sometimes. You know? But the, the, how they handle it is wrong. Because if you're walking in love, there is no murmuring. Murmuring is a sin. Murmuring is a sin, friend. It's more of a sin than you going out, you know, fornicating or drinking a beer. Right? Now, I, I need to be careful saying that because all sin is sin, period. But what I'm saying, murmuring will get you destroyed. And actually, so will that, you know, uh, fornication in the sense of uh, what uh, happened in 1 Corinthians 10 with children of Israel when they were going out there with idols and they were just having all kind of orgies and filth going on uh, when Moses went up to the mountain. And so, but the reality is, is murmuring, complaining and griping is one of the most perverse things that any Christian can do. Because it says that God's hand is short. It's saying he doesn't love me. It's saying he's not able to help me, rescue me, deliver me, forgive me, cleanse me. He's not able to heal me. He's not able to help me. He's not able to change me. You know? And all it is is a very adolescent attitude. Like a little child that doesn't get what they want. They throw a temper tantrum. How many ever seen children? And a lot of parents today let that happen. The child throws a temper tantrum. They start getting on the floor, screaming, pouting, making, making a, a, you know, noise. And the parents just let them. I thank God that my kids never did that. I'm being honest with you. My children never once manifested like that. Just by the grace of God, because it's demonic. Because little demons can influence children's minds. How many understand that? Because children are immature. And when you don't recognize, uh, you know, and you're not aware that you're a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body, you'll just yield yourself to something. Not, now, I don't mean that like I was so great. So I want to make sure, I want to make sure we always have to clarify. We say some stuff and then we have to reflect. It's only because of the teaching of the word and, and the Holy Spirit and God's leadership that it, I was able to uh, help my children so they didn't manifest in that those ways. Amen. Uh, it's not because we're so great. It's just because that God's faithful, His Word works. Amen. And so, uh, where are we at? Where were we at? Oh, Titus. Oh no, I was talking about all the grumbling, the griping, like a child grumbling and complaining is very dangerous. And how many of you ever feel like grumbling, griping, complaining? But what you have to do is you have to recognize that that is a part of your natural man trying to rise up and usurp authority over your spirit. It's trying to place your spirit and 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 in in a a a place of subservienthood, a place that uh, you know where your flesh and your mind and can just be free and do what it wants. But a lot of people go, I'm just me. I'm just free. No, you're free and you're just you in the flesh. And you in the flesh is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. As we read here, because he that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. 
God does not lie. Corruption I'm talking about is not. See, this is a lot of the church world used to do. Now they've gone to the other excess, which is they used to look around for people, you know, like drinking and fornicating and cussing. They were on like a, a little uh, mission trying to find people's outward favors and flaws. But now that most of the, lots of the church world has gone to the excess, which they don't even mention sin anymore. They don't even mention favors and flaws. So now they're in excess because they don't want to be like that because that was wrong too. How many of you understand that? Just focusing on the failures, the flaws, the deficits and defects of the natural man are wrong, right? But if you, you know, Jesus had it real simple. Talk to the woman that uh, committed adultery. He said, neither do I condemn you, but go and be free and be loosed and healed and don't do it again. Right? So, but a lot of this stuff, these fears that go on, manifest through these things this grumbling this complaining this feeling like i'm not getting my part you know you know i'm missing out i'm being neglected what about me come on now where's my portion amen you're not limited and the truth is is many times you and i really aren't Ex exhibiting the faith we haven't spent the time to develop our faith i'm not saying someone in the world that you know uh some of these uh uh what do you call them lord uh what was i looking for i was looking at this school this morning and i was just thinking wow man they they have a lot of resources and how is it that these people have gotten into the earth with so much wealth and stuff well you and i aren't limited you're not limited come on now it don't take, I mean, if you're doing what you're doing, and sometimes you got to stand up before the Lord and plead your cause. If you're a tither and a giver and a person that's endeavoring, you got to, you got to get, you can't just be a tither and giver and sow and then go and just expect it. I mean, no more than you plant a seed. You got to water it. You got to attend to it. And for you and I, you've got to give attention. You got to have vision. And then at times the Lord says, come and reason with me together, plead your cause. And say, so, hold on a sec, Lord, I'm not blaming you, but is there something that, that seems slow right here? I need some resources. Because well, when you start looking at all these little heathen running around the earth that ain't serving the Lord, that, that aren't tithers, they're not givers, well, what's the problem? The problem is you and I aren't receiving. We're not receiving like we should. Amen? We're just expecting God to do it when the reality is there's some things that need to be put in operation. Amen. There's some things that need to go in operation, like your confession of faith, you laying hold on some things, you taking authority over the devil, trying to bind and restrict, you know, the flow of currency to your life. Matter of fact, the Lord, I'm going to take a side journey on this, like the Lord uh, prompted me the other day, Psalms 126. I'm just going to read it to you. And then we're going to get some of the other stuff real quick. Psalms, matter of fact, head over to, I told you, uh, uh, Titus, all Titus was going to tell you that. Through, through the renewal of the Holy Ghost, you've been regenerated. And so God placed in you the love of God. He placed in you a spirit of faith, not a spirit of fear. There is no fear on the inside of you. You have to embrace the fear, the force of fear that comes from the external realm. You have to receive that. You have to acknowledge that because it's not inside of you. There is no fear in there. If you're born again, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You've been regenerated. Titus says, regene the law of the spirit of life now in Christ Jesus made you free from the law of sin and death. There's no fear in love, 1 John 4, 18 says. Perfect love casts out fear. Notice, casts it out. Why? Because fear tries to, tries to come and find its place in your mind and in your emotions. And you got to cast it out of your thought life. So it don't dominate you. That's how people say all the time. They can say, oh, I'm full of joy. And you're like, no, you ain't. You're lying. <laughs> you're lying because you're full of joy. You're at rest. You're peaceable. There's a graciousness about you. You can't be full of joy walking around all tense with a mean mugging look on your face. How many of you understand what I'm saying? You can't. You can't be walking around life looking like that. Going, I'm full of the joy of the Lord, man. Homeboy. Homegirl. Uh-huh. We hear you. <laughs> there has to be a fluidity. Amen. A happiness, a beat, uh, you know, a pep to your step. 
Amen. You can't be moved by anything in this world. It's like I was telling someone the other day, you know, I was telling those guys like, I don't really share all my testimony. I was telling this guy on Friday and I go, look, man, like this guy tried to tell somebody one time, he's like, man, brother, I think you're called to the like street people and, and, you know, hardcore people and all that. I'm like, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I meet people like that all the time. But I meet all kinds of other people, family people, people with jobs, doctors, lawyers, this, who become all things to all people. Don't limit yourself. Right? Now, some people, they can't climb that ladder and speak to a doctor because they ain't educated themselves in the word enough. You know? I remember early on, I'd speak to anybody. I knew that. Now, of course, you know, like I was speaking to these dudes on Friday night. There are three of them right there out of a, a prison ministry called the Jericho House. I was talking to these guys for a minute and I asked them well what are you guys all about Jericho sounds like Christian but it's not they're like no nah, we just work <laughs> I'm like okay <laughs> you just work that's what you guys do yep work I was like well what's your program because there's so many programs that deal with like drug addicts and people that have been in prison and all this stuff and I'm like okay well I'm a Christian you know I'm not against anything else but I believe that's what and then I just shared a little bit about my story two seconds I said that's worse for me I can't depend on anything else. I'm too dangerous. No, serious. What's the truth? You wouldn't think that, though. No, serious. I'm not kidding. I've seen a lot of people, and I told those guys that tell Eric, the other day, man, there's a lot of people I see. Like, even when I was preaching at San Quentin, they got tattoos all on their face everywhere. I go, man, you know what I see when I see a person like that? Scared little child. Except now they're in an adult body. They're scared. Their whole life, they didn't know who they were. They need a hug. They need some love. And, and look at you. You're afraid of humanity. You want to keep people out because you're so afraid. You probably were picked on when you were a little kid. There's a lot of people like that. They've been dogged out as a little kid and all this and that. And then you just think, what happened? The devil got a hold of them. Now they got pink hair, purple hair, yellow ears, this. They became this. They became that. They're opposed to anything structured or oriented. Got an earring here, an earring there, one there, one and it, it, all over desecrating themselves and i'm just telling you amen no i don't focus on none of that but i'm telling you when you see that you as a believer need to know they have an identity crisis don't they just like i did as a youngster so i told him i'm not moved by none of that you know what i'm moved by i'm moved by somebody like when i was in the church i went to and and i was at uh, college and the, now they're a pastor now uh melina who had never defiled herself with the world. Carried a little bottle around. Like, those are people we despised when we were younger. Be, you know, acting like heathens and devils and thinking we're all hard and tough and drinking and all that. We looked at those people like, oh, man. But those are the people that have more honor. You know why? They have more honor. Because they could have went the route you and I went. They chose to honor God. They exhibited a level of faith. Now, granted, you and I may not have known what they knew. They were brought up in a Christian home. But I'm telling you, I'm more impressed by that. To meet someone that goes, you know, I I've kept myself and I've served the Lord. Like some of these youngsters in here on Friday night that were here from L.A. And I was telling Eric, and they're all kind of like, mm -hmm, you know. And I'm like, you know, bro, and they're outside baptizing people with water bottles. And I go... I think years ago, it probably would have bugged me, like, man, just go to a baptismal, but you got to realize, man, I was like, I'd rather see him out front baptizing people with bottles of water than out getting drunk and fornicating and smoking drugs and, and being, you know, wayward and, and doing everything else, you know, so you just, you know, realize this younger generation, they're a lot different, but they're set apart. They're not following the world. You know how much, you know how hard it is for a youngster right now? There's so much more trash in this world. They got, they got Twitter. They got Facebook. They got, what's the other one? Instagram. I mean, they're looking at this cr crap, excuse my French, all the time. Their minds are interdated. Yesterday, me and Caleb were working out, and I'm like, dude, put the phone down. It bugs me. Like, chill. 
And then the way they are, you, I got on it for a couple of minutes. He's like, hey, put your phone down. You're always on that thing. You're obsessed with it. And it's like, I was making a phone call. I was actually talking to Rick. So see how, you know, the broken mind sometimes tries to turn it on you. But I'm sharper than that. I'm like, stop it, man. You're, because the reality is, if you look at kids today, they are on that phone all day long. You know? So if you're going to be on it, get something productive on there. Get the word. Actually, he was watching some football things, but his friends are on there and they watch all that Instagram and just the stupidest stuff. You know, if you're going to watch something, watch something that's legit. You know, so where did I tell you to go? Psalms 120, 126. You ready? Here we go. I'm going to hurry up and bring this down a couple of verses. Psalms 126. Psalms 120. When the Lord brought back the captive who returned to Zion, we were like those. I want you to hear this now. We were like those who dreamed. It seemed so unreal. Then were our mouths filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. Then said we among the nations, the Lord's done great things among them. The Lord's done great things. We are glad. We're not sad. We're glad. Are you glad this morning? I don't really care how long I've been preaching. I'm just speaking the word. And if you're eating the word, see, the word is like a stimulant as well. The word's a stimulant if you receive it in your spirit. Amen. It's a stimulant. It's better than the caffeine and the Red Bulls and all the other garbage. It's, that's not, this ain't my point. Listen, I want you to hear this. Turn to freedom our captivity. Now listen. Restore our fortunes, O oh Lord, as the streams in the south, Negev, are restored by the torrents. Look at Psalms 126 in the Amplified. That's what I'm reading. I'm in, I'm in verse four. Turn, I'm in the Amplified. Psalms 126. Turn to our freedom, our captivity. Restore our fortunes. Just listen. As the streams in the south are restored by the torrents. So the torrents cause the streams and things to come into order, don't they? They bring restoration. Amen. In the same light, listen very carefully. In the same light, the psalmist David says, restore my fortunes like that's restored. Meaning, breathe upon my finances. Breathe upon my economic situation. Amen. Don't just sit around going, well, I work your little job because you don't make enough money. Because I don't want I don't want to check your givings. But I mean, to really, you know, <laughs> to give the way God wants us to give. Giving is something that you and I should live for. Actually, the, the scripture tells you, you know, let him work that he may have to what? Give. People say, no, I got to work for me and myself. And my family. That's not what the Bible teaches, friend. You're deceived. The Bible says work. Ephesians chapter four tells you to work, to give. You live as a Christian by your giving. You don't meet your own needs. You, you're not your need meter. God is your need meter. That's what Paul said. He meets all your needs. He, he. He, Jehovah Jireh, meets your needs according to his riches and glory. You are not your need meter. Yeah, you got to work, but don't put your dependency all on your work because then you'll start working yourself. Work, 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 and then you ain't got time for church no more. You're just a little worker, worker. And guess what? Guess what he says about all those people? You know what he says about all those people that are obsessed with trying to work and get ahead? You know what Malachi tells them? And Haggai tells them? Says they got holes in their pocket. You ever seen people work all these hours? I had a guy tell me the other day. Matter of fact, I don't even want to say. He, tell, he makes a lot of money and he goes, I have nothing left, man. And I said, that's because you ain't a tither and a giver. No, I'm serious. 
He always tells me, God, nothing, nothing. and he's work. I go, brother, you're working so hard, you're losing your hair. You need a break, man. But you know the break he needs is not a vacation in Hawaii. The break he needs is a break of with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people, but for all they would not listen. This is the place, the rest, where I cause the weary to rest. In tongues, praying in the spirit, with the body, in fellowship, resting in the Holy Ghost. Amen? Resting. And I'll tell you, there's some moves of God, like last Wednesday, it get, you don't want it to, but just like the streams, the torrents return the streams, it, it just carries you for a couple of days. Sometimes there's just a move of God that just carries you for a couple of days. Amen? In your spirit. Now, hopefully you're smart enough to keep feeding on that. You just don't want to ride that wave out. Praise the Lord. But fear will do the opposite. Look real quick in Acts 27 while you're there. We're going to look at a couple of verses, and then we'll close it up. I'm just going to read these. The Lord always addressed these things. Look what King David said. King David had a spirit of fear. You and I, I mean, a spirit of faith. You and I have a spirit of faith. Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Look what he said. Whom shall I fear? I mean, that's quite an amazing statement, isn't it? Whom? What? Come on. If God be for me, who? But then, see, we need to say that, but then we need to act like it, don't we? We need to live like that. So when the pressure and the adversity come, the fangs and the, the claws don't come out. Get my point? The hammer don't come out. The ugly part of life don't come out. When the wicked, look at my enemies and foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumble and fall. Though a host encamp again, look it. Do you know what it's like? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go off from here. Though a host encamp against me, a host. Do you know what a host means? An arraignment of people looking to destroy and devour your life. A host, a multitude of things, of challenges, of adversities, of trials. First Peter says, um, seeing you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, manifold trials, that the testing and trying of your faith is more precious than gold, though it be tried by fire, might be found under praise, honor, and glory. I'm telling you, has your faith and my faith, will it be found under praise, honor, and glory? Or, or will the adversity, the challenge, the trials, the problem show up, and then your, fa your faith is devoured, just like Jesus prayed for Peter. I pray that your faith don't fail. That actually through the storm, the adversity, the trial, you laughing all the way going, sorry, Mr. Enemy. I'm not moved like the Apostle Paul said. I count not my life dear unto me. None of these things move me. Oh, people may come and people may go. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. But none of these things move me. I count not my life dear unto myself. I press on towards the mark of the high calling of God. Come on. Though the earth falter, though the hills be removed. Come on. Though the mountains be cast into the sea. Come on. There is a river whose streams make glad, not sad, make glad. So the next time fear and adversity and problems come, find yourself a little place and get glad. And then call me up so I can come film it. So I can actually see that you're glad. That you didn't just smile at church. That it was outside of church. That's where the work needs to be done. I'm not impressed by people running around doing flags and music in church. I want to see how you act during the week. When your trial comes and the money's low and the problems come. I want to see how big of a, a joy fit you can have. I want, I, I want to hear you start to talk down to the problem, not up to the problem. Amen. I want to hear some, some battle talk like gladiator as he encouraged them as they were going into battle. And he said, 
Know this today, gentlemen, on this battlefield. He basically said, if you find yourself in paradise, know that you're in Elysium, meaning you've died. And then he laughed. Fear of death for you and I. Amen. Fear of death been stripped. See, the devil will get you in a little vicious cycle just living. Go to work, go home, pay your bills, and you think you're doing life. And then COVID hit and you were in the hospital and you were gone and all your stuff got left to your wife, your husband, or your relatives or the government. But you thought you were smarter than God. That's how it works. You think I'm kidding? That's how it works. Or they're driving down the road and all of a sudden, boop, something happens and they have one of those things go on. But, but, but you know, I was like the rich fool. Remember the rich fool? I was going to tear down all my stuff. I was going to build everything. And then my soul was required of me. Come on now. You're living in a time period. This ain't no fear. I'm just reading you what Jesus said. People say, you're scaring me. I'm not scaring you. I'm just telling you what's in red letters. If you want to say you're afraid, then you should say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm afraid because I don't like the red letters. And Jesus will say, that's the problem. You're not perfected in love. Why you got all that fear? Why you got all that fear? Because I just told you what Psalm 46 said. Though the mountains be cast in the sea, though, though it all go under, he said, nope, there is a river. Amen? There is a river. There is a river. Look what he said. God is my refuge and my very present help. Come on. He says, no matter what, when it all starts crumbling and, and the apocalypse happens, you're going to be the one standing on the mountain. Go, God is my refuge and my fortress. There is a very present help. You're not going to be one of them other Christians hunkering and bunkering and running back in. Not if you're under this ministry. He says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, friend, though nuclear bombs start popping off, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the sea, though the waters roar, though they be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst and she shall not be moved. Hello? Come on now. I want to see some Christians like this. I'm tired of little panky little Christians that say one thing in church, but they ain't living it out there. I want them to say, man, I'm not worried about if a nuclear missile goes. I'll be insulated. I'm not worried if I lost my job. Oh, my God. What will I do? What about all my deals? What about this? What about that? Yeah, there you go, grumbling, griping, and complaining. When the Lord said, you should have stood up and said, the Lord is my provider. Oh, like Abraham. should have went, hold on, son. God shall provide himself and not over there in the corner whining and crying and acting like a little baby because you didn't see the dollar show up. It's essentially pimped by this earth, as they like to say, by the Babylonian system because you didn't have the real faith to ride you through that storm. The same goes for me, friend. Get this fire from the crucible, just to tell you. So you don't get that fire just because you get a little pulpit. You don't. Amen. Just to let you know, you don't get anointing from a pulpit. Some people think they do. They're sadly mistaken. <laughs> you get anointing from hearing the word. And then the faith that's in you, when the adversity shows up, you have to live what you preach. You have to live what you, you tell your children. You got to live it. How many of you know? There's a river. So God's saying, no matter what happens, let me see how joyful you are. Count it all joy, friend. When you face trials of many kinds. So you can see there's a lot of growth that needs to happen in all of us. Not just us, but a lot of Christians in San Francisco. Now, I think you and I understand this, but guess what? No matter how much I understand it, let me tell you something. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. The minute you think you're all right here and you're hunky-dory and you got it all together, I tell you, you're on your way down real quick and you don't realize it. And I'm not talking maybe naturally. I'm talking spiritually. You have digressed because you think, I already know that. It's not what you know. It's what you practice. Jerry Rice, practice, 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 practice. That's why he's a Hall of Famer and the greatest receiver of all time. And I actually heard him say myself, he says, you know, I didn't really enjoy my success because I was always training. Well, so what? You can enjoy your success while you're training. But he didn't know that. You can enjoy your walk with God while you're, you know, practicing these things. Let's look real quick. Second Chronicles. I got a couple. He says, look at, look at the psalmist said, Rich. He says, though a host encamp about me, though a host. I will not fear. I will be confident, Psalm 27. And then actually a verse that the Lord gave me a long time ago now, when I was first a Christian. I had fainted lest I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living. You know what that means? Fainted. Literally fainted. The other day, and I was I was laughing. I was I shouldn't have been laughing, but I saw this thing on Facebook where this guy took the jab. And he literally passed out. He's like, I don't know if he was nervous or it just affected him, but he just <laughs> fainted. And that's what David said. I'd faint it unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord where? In heaven? Right now. Come on now. I know you and I are about to see some supernatural increase in enlargement financially. I'm telling you. I, I see it. The Lord gave me that verse. But you got to say, Lord, send the wind breathe blow come on touch my resources touch my finances come on i'm expecting exceeding abundantly above all i can ask or think send the rain man but i'll tell you it's like i, I read that sent that thing the other day or 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 oh no i didn't send it to you guys it was about rick renner he asked himself when the finances ain't working is there some issues in my heart that are blocking it you have to check sometimes there's issues in our lives. Sometimes it's just the devil. Sometimes it's sin. Sin in the way of not walking in love. Sin in the way of not forgiving. Sin in the way of uh, murmuring, gossiping, complaining. Sin in the way of not being patient. Sin in the way of not, not walking in the joy and the oil of gladness. Sin of trying to get out of church at 12 o'clock. <laughs> because you want to feed your little belly. All right, here you go. Go over to Second Chronicles or if watch a football game. I honored Kim this morning and wore my red shoes. These are bad boys. So you have to be you have to be strong in the Lord to wear these. See what I'm saying? You can't wear those, Rich. Rich, you can't wear those. Hey, look at that, man. You got to have Holy Ghost power in you to wear these red flames. He's walking on fire, man. These are bad, man. These are bad. I'm serious. These are bad. I'll tell you when I like suede. I was walking through LA on the way to in in the East LA one time, and I walked into one of these, you know, those cheap shoe stores, but they got like all kind of stuff, and and I walked out with a pair of blue suede shoes. <laughs> I was like, man, these things are bad, boy. I'm serious. I was walking out East LA like, man, these things are bad, man. And all I can think about is Elvis Presley. And from that day forward, it was like, man, I was like suede. Like, I, I, I don't know where it came, but it's like, I like suede. Suede is bad, man. Amen. Persuade. Okay. Go to 2 Chronicles real quick. Got to look at a couple little pieces. 2 Chronicles. Uh, let me see real quick. Oh. Though a host encamp against me, 2 Chronicles uh, 20. Look at this dude. Here we go. Uh, Second Chronicles 20. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab, verse 1, children of Moab and the children of Ammon, with them other, other besides the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat. Then to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, 
there comes a great multitude against you and beyond the Syrian and behold, so forth, so on. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Now, I believe this. There's some things that why these enemies came out against Jehoshaphat. Here's one of them. Look in, look in chapter 19. This is just one of the reasons. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. You'd have to read chapter 18. And Jew, Jehu, Jehu, the son of Hania, the seer, which is a prophet, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are some good things found in you, and you've taken away the groves and the false idols and prepared your heart to seek the Lord. You ready? Here you go. That, that was verse 2 and 3. Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 19. Didn't I say that? 19. Okay. I'm saying it again. 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 19, 1, 2, and 3. And then... Chapter 20, I started with, as to why these people came out against them. The prophet came to him and said, look, bro, why are you loving the ungodly and you love people that hate the Lord? See, you look in society now as Christians, you have all these people trying to, uh, uh, they're trying to embrace the communities. They embrace the LGBTQ, whatever they are, community. They embrace the Black Lives Matter communities. They embrace, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, or they embrace this, or they embrace that. They embrace all these things that are ungodly. Okay? And the prophet said, look, this is a really good verse some verses that give us revelation that, look, there can be some really good things in Kim. Like Jehoshaphat tore down all the altars to them false uh, uh, demonic uh, uh, rituals, the groves. So he was recognized in that he had some godly perspectives and things he did good, but he had some other perspectives and lifestyles and ways that are just totally ungodly. And so it exposed and opened his life up to things. Now, if you read the former chapters, why was he in confederate with some of these kings? He's compromised in some areas. Yep. So, but look what happens. Look at down on verse 13, chapter 20, verse 13. But at least he has a heart for God. How many of you know? And sometimes people can have a heart for God. Yeah, brother. Uh, sometimes people can have a heart for God, but be negligent, ignorant. They have a heart for God, but they're just ignorant. Because they're not teachable and they won't listen. So they don't listen. They think they know and they neglect. And then the prophet has to come tell them, look, man, think about this. If a man of God has to approach and tell you, look, Mr. King, well, why would you be doing this? This is not godly. Yet you have some go godly traits going on in your life. See, but he wouldn't listen before. So it cost him. And thank God, God was there to rescue, rescue him. He said it's hard to pray. He was a person of prayer. Verse, verse 13 says, And then all Jude, Judah stood before the Lord with the little ones and their wives and children and Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, so forth, so on. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in the midst, and he said, Hearken all you Judean, Judea, Judeus, you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Look at, and you King Jehoshaphat. Because now the army, I mean, these people are about to invade and take over. So now, why wait till they take over before the prophet can speak? He says, thus says the Lord, be not afraid. Be not fearful, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You see that? Be, he addressed their issue. Fear, 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 and more fear. One more time. Two more verses and we're blowing out of here. Here you go. Many times things in our lives are fear-based, even though God hadn't given us a spirit of fear. Go on over to uh go go to uh, numbers. Numbers. 
we could go to Exodus 14 and then Numbers 13. Numbers 13 is just a, a recap of what went on in Exodus 14. Exodus 14, 13, Moses said, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Right? Fear not. Stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. So he says, fear not. He addresses their fear issue. Why? They were coming to the Red Sea. Cheryl was behind them. So all these outward circumstances. So this whole message, how is it? Are you going to just sit here in church today and then go out of here? Or are you going to look honestly and address the, the things that are circumstantial in your life today? The past, the fractures, the wounds, the emotions, the challenges, the things that are haunting and tormenting you and keeping you in a fearful condition. And if you're in a fearful condition, you're in an adolescent condition. Because only faith prevails. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith. Faith. That's just overcoming the world. <laughs> you know what I mean by the world? All the garbage that's in the world. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, cares of the world, anxiety of the ages. It's like this guy came the other day. We were talking on the other night. I was talking with Eric. And this guy... This guy uh, called and he said he was so afraid he was about to go into the hospital and he had just took a COVID test. He just took a test and the guy was freaked out, man. He, he to the, like I told you, the guy a week before was ready to commit suicide. I talked to him on the phone. All these people, they're natural. They're not saved. They don't have what you have. How much more should you eradicate any trace so that you're just full of glory, full of power, full of life, full of joy? It's possible. You have to be in control of your thought life. Right here, he says, Numbers, Numbers 13, verse uh, uh, 26, the latter part of the chapter. And they brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Look, they brought back the evidence of the blessings. And they told them, oh man, this land is flowing with milk and honey. And then they gave them a evil report. An evil report. Nevertheless, the people are strong. See that? And the cities are walled, and they're very great. It's nothing worse than a Christian magnifying the work of the devil. And this COVID, and, and man, this is serious, serious pandemic stuff, man. Heavy duty, such as not before. You know, very great, they said. Moreover, they saw the children of Anak. They saw, they saw with their eyeballs, their little beady eyeballs. <laughs> and the Amicates and the Hattites and the Amorites. Whatever they are. And Caleb stood up and said, shut your face. <laughs> That's what he said. Not really what he said shut your face he stilled the people read the word still go look it up what he's saying is shut your mouth because your mouth is a pit of iniquity and you are rebelling against the lord imagine that now here let's stop right here because all the people that go out and they go in the streets and they tell the world the world's full of inequity and sin and yet Caleb says you're full of inequity you shut that mouth because all that's coming out of that mouth is unbelief murmuring sin sin right out of your mouth and you're rebelling against God that's what he said rebel Christian rebels Blame in the world. That's what he said right here. Verse 9. Do not rebel against the Lord. All the people are looking out there at the world and everybody else. The reality is they're rebelling with their words. Just like that guy's out there, you know, doing whatever they're doing in their flesh. Man, you're rebelling. Because your mouth. Because your fear. 
Because all you did is you saw those great walls, those big old giants, them circumstances, lack of money. You saw the symptoms. You felt this. You felt that. All the stuff. And then you gave yourself to it. And then you opened your mouth against God. And the God that a lot of people know in San Francisco would, would just say, that's all right, Brother Kim. Rebel against me. It's okay. Don't worry about it. That challenge is too hard for you. That's how they act. When Jesus would never tolerate that. Thus, the back of the boat. Not the back of the bus, but the back of the boat. Have you ever been on the back of the boat with 12 Jews full of unbelief? It's not racism, I just said. Have you ever been on the back of a boat with 12 Jews who are full of unbelief? Just telling you what the scripture says. And Jesus said, where is your faith? Because the same storm and circumstances and situation and they went Jesus <laughs> and they started profusely getting anxiety and 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 worry and, and Jesus don't you care for me Jesus <laughs> Jesus don't you care for us stupidest question you can ever ask the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and if you've ever asked that you need to repent you do need to repent because you question his loyalty to you. And he's more loyal to you than you ever will be loyal to him. Never forget that. That was said by the Holy Ghost. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And I'm, I'm included. I'm included with you. And whoever else is watching. Because that's what they said. Don't you care? Think about the condition that fear maneuvered them into. We're going to close. It maneuvered them into accusing their very own savior of his loyalty, his love, his ability to keep them safe and sound, his ability to sustain them. They attacked him. They attacked their own king, their own captain of salvation. They attacked the one who was just trying to get a rest. <laughs> Woke him up with all their garbage. Woke them up with all their fear. Woke them up with all their anxiety. Woke them up with all their stress. Woke them up with their fear of death. Hmm? You can just look at our lives and see. We may not be as extravagant as them, but there's probably something we can trace out in our lives just by learning this. The last one. Last one. I'm not even going to go there. Joshua. Come on now. This is good. And that's when revival comes. See, I never mention the word revival because I don't need to. Because if you obey these things that I've taught this morning, oh, revival will happen in your own life personally. Amen. You won't need to go, hey, we need to go teach revival. Let's go have a revival session. I'll tell you, if you'll repent, revival will hit you. And not repent from deeds. Repent from a heart of unbelief. A heart of disloyalty. See, the, the Christians that focus on all people need to repent because of their deeds. No. Look what John the Baptist said. The axe is laid to the root. The root is the problem. That's why scripture says, as you therefore receive Christ Jesus, uh, uh, as you walk in him, rooted in him, rooted. See, you're either rooted in Christ or you're rooted in sin, the law of sin and death, the old Adamic nature, the, 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 the influence of the world. You get my point? You, you rooted in him. Then the reality is when the storms come, you say, no, nope, sorry, I'm not allowing you to affect my mind, my emotions, my feelings. I'm not going to allow you to affect my mouth. Amen. And we know this, but faith comes by hearing. Joshua, here we go. Joshua 1. I know you guys are ready to go. Good. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. Because this is what we need in our country right now. In our nation as a body of Christ. 
How can we shine if we're the ones that are all fearful? How can the body of Christ shine when the uh, majorities of the body of Christ are afraid of COVID? They're start trying to figure out how to deal with it. Here's how you deal with it. Here's how you deal with it right here. Fear not. Stand firm. And then you'll see the salvation, the delivering, preserving, keeping power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, I had this thought. I thought, while we think the world, you know, sometimes other stuff is going on around you. But God has insulated you from it. And you don't realize it. You don't. Just like in the book of Exodus, there was light in Goshen, but yet everything else in Egypt was dark. So the people with the lights on didn't know any different. And I think that's happened to maybe some of us, or, or it's happened to me because I thought, what is going on why people can't just see? Because there's light in Goshen, but there's darkness in the other places. And it dawned on me once or twice already. I'm thinking, well, well, maybe, Lord, maybe I'm just insulated and preserved from not only the COVID, but all the junk going on around it. Just the hysteria of the world. I mean, go look what's going on in Australia. They've been on lockdown still. My point I'm trying to tell you is, and, and then just the foolishness going on in the country here. You know, with the southern border and all these people coming in, they're not vaxxed and they're not this and they're not vetted, but yet you can't even walk into a restaurant. I mean, come on, man. You know, I'm just saying, look at it all. It's a bunch of confusion. It's like one of those balls of rubber bands. You just roll up like a whole ball of rubber bands. And I'm thinking, none of it bugs me personally, but I think I feel sorry for people that live confused in this realm out here. And it just dawned on me. I was like, Fear not. Stand still. Because you and I belong to him. Does he love the rest of the world? Yes. But they have to choose this. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. It's like I told someone, I, I said, I would be highly disappointed. I would. If, if, if I was attacked with COVID or, or any, I would be really disappointed because I've, I've staked my life on this word, but I know God's faithful. Now, of course, that's why I said you and I need to make sure we're flying right. Know what I mean? And for you and I, that means, look, we're not going to be out drinking and cussing and fornicating the line, but we need to make sure we ain't letting no resentment get in our heart. We make sure we ain't letting a seed of unbelief getting there. We're making sure that we're not lapsing in our loyalties and our commitment to God in any area and that we're actually doubling up for the ride because it's exciting times. Amen. It is. I think it's an exciting time. Sometimes I get frustrated because it's like you want to have fun. Oh, you, wanna, you ever wanted to have fun and you go somewhere and you were a little kid and they didn't have cell phones. And, 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 and you went over to your friend's house. And you're like, yo, we're going to the field. And you need it. One more player. You had all the other boys on board. And you got a team. You're going to have a and, – and then all of a sudden, you go knock on this one guy's house. And he opens the window and he tells you, I can't – my mom won't let me out. You are disappointed, aren't you? Because you expect it like the fun and the, the, the thing to go on. Here it is, Rich. Rich, can you pass those out, please? Can you hop off your thing? Joshua 1, the Lord said to Joshua, verse 5, that no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as it was with Moses. I'll be with you. I'll not fail you or forsake you. So be strong. Be very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. And in chapter 10, 
the Amorites came against them. Amorites came against Joshua. They called on him. Verse 7, so Joshua sent it from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of Valier. And the Lord said to Joshua, fear them not. Fear them not, for I have delivered them in your hand, and there shall no man stand before you. Now, here's my point. That most likely, even though that God told Joshua, no man will be able to stand before you. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Fear tries to beseech you. Fear tries to uh, isolate you. And that's what happened here with Joshua. It was time to go to war. All the soldiers. And the, and the Lord said to him, fear not. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.